It's been a while, but we're back. Welcome along to 20 Minute Topic. I'm Marcus Stead, and I'm joined as usual by veteran campaigner and blogger Greg Lance Watkins. The situation on the Russia-Ukraine border is becoming more serious by the day. There are now 130,000 Russian troops on the border. But what's it really all about? The history, the politics and the demography of Ukraine is complex and bloody. We are being told by the mainstream media that Russian President Vladimir Putin could be about to invade Ukraine. Really? President Putin is many things, but I have seen little evidence that he's mad. There's a lot more to this story than the simple cliches we are seeing banded about on our TV news bulletins. Do stay with us. Well, Greg, this is our first podcast for a while, and we're doing it under very serious conditions because the situation in Ukraine could escalate at any time. But I think the first thing to do is have a little bit of perspective of this. Now, I am not a pacifist by any means, but I am somebody who believes that war and conflict and violence should always be the last option after all other avenues have been explored. And I don't believe in this case, all other avenues have been explored by a long way. I also think we need to have a sense of perspective about this. The British army has 75,000 troops. The Russian army has more than a million troops. The British army is more than halved in size since the early 1990s. The Royal Navy is a shadow of its former self in terms of size. I do wonder whether we could recapture the Falklands any longer. The Russian Navy is also not in good shape. I'm going to talk in a moment, Greg, about how this is a far more complex situation than the mainstream media, particularly the BBC, would have us believe. Ukraine's history is bloody, it's violent, and it's not a nation as such in that it has a shared identity. There are conflicting segments of Ukrainian society. What are your primary concerns in light of what has gone on as this situation has escalated over the last few weeks? You say conflicting sectors of the Ukrainian society. It's beginning to sound a bit like Britain. With our conflicting sectors, with devolved lunacy in every corner, you, at least the Ukraine is moving in the other direction when left alone. However, you say we must explore other avenues. I totally agree, except there's one major drawback. We're not calling any of the shops. And we have very little clout. And as for divided nations, America's a pretty good example, where at the moment it's three to one that Trump will get re-elected. What really concerns me at the moment, on not just in this context, but in a global context, in the global balance of power, is the lack of leadership coming from the United States, where we've got Joe Biden, who... To put it politely, I believe, is in the early stages of dementia. He is not the Joe Biden I remember as vice president to Barack Obama. I recall in 2008 staying up late to watch the vice presidential candidates debate between himself and Sarah Palin. It was good natured. He was on the ball. He was sharp and spectacular, but good enough to do the job. This is a very different Joe Biden we have today. I do not believe that Kamala Harris is in charge either. She is making very strong signals at the moment that she wants out as vice president and appears to be looking for a way out as far as I can tell. But going back to this situation specifically in relation to Ukraine, you talked about Britain becoming increasingly divided and Ukraine trying to go in the opposite direction. I take a slightly different view to you on this, Greg, because the history of Ukraine is bloody and it's complex. The area around Donetsk identifies strongly with Russia, the people are Russian speaking, and they consider themselves of Russian heritage. Now, with the collapse of the Soviet Union, a bit of historical context, and some of our younger listeners, you've got to remember, I was born in 1983, I can just about remember the events of the late 80s, early 90s. People younger than me will not really have as much concept of this unless they're well read on the subject. The collapse of the Soviet Union, Russia gave up a lot of land it allowed the reunification of Germany, which actually Margaret Thatcher wasn't all that keen on. But in return, the deal was that NATO wouldn't expand eastwards. And there is a significant body of documentation, uh, which is now in Washington University, that backs this up. That was essentially what the deal was at the time in terms of the global balance of power. Now, to move the story forward, the overthrow of President Yanukovych in Ukraine in 2014 
well, that was a that the way that was reported as though Yanukovych was the bad guy and the protesters and the new government were the good guys. The truth was far more complex because point one, if you didn't like Yanukovych and if the West had concerns about Yanukovych, well, an election was due within a year anyway. This was 2014 we're talking about. The overthrow was bad news for those who consider themselves ethnically Russian. There was anger because Yanukovych was unwilling to sign a political association or a trade agreement with the European Union. But those people who were involved in that protest, Greg, uh, and who were involved in the overthrow, there were some very, very nasty elements among them. There were Nazi sympathizers, football hooligans, ultras, and others. The government that followed post-2014 was very pro-EU, signed that agreement, Russia refused to recognize the new government, believing with some justification, in my view, that it was, uh, it was illegitimate. It, it wasn't elected by democratic means. It wasn't elected at all. Now, going back to the point I was making a moment ago, and this is where I want you to explain the options in regards to this, Greg. The greatest anti-Soviet diplomat of the immediate post-Cold War era, George Kennan, he's come out of retirement recently and made some interesting comments but he warned against the expansion of NATO towards Russia's borders. He said the expansion of NATO right up into the Russian border is the greatest mistake of the post-Cold War period. And th then you've also got Yegor Gaidar, the former Russian prime minister, somebody liked in the West because of his economic reforms. He contacted Canada's ambassador, Chris Westall, in Moscow in 2004 to say he had come to beg, to plead, to advise Ottawa against further NATO expansion, which would, he warned, bring out the worst of Russian instinct. Now, Greg, there are what? We're told 100,000 Russian troops near the Ukrainian border at the moment. But we can see it's not as though the West has stuck to what was agreed at the collapse of the Soviet Union, is it? The Soviet Union had no say in what was agreed. The Soviet Union had collapsed. It had withdrawn because it had been defeated, not by force of arms, because we could, we could in fact, at that stage, have done that without too much trouble. Their aeroplanes were rubbish, their navy was large and incompetent, and their army was, yes, it was large, but look what happened to it in Afghanistan, to show you how good or bad it was. That it really wasn't the power that it believed it was, or many, in the West believed it was. Its main power in those days was sabotaging our nuclear energy, which they did by funding CND around the world. That was their power. Their power structure, as it appeared, didn't realistically exist. They had no clout. It's a very different Russia we would deal with now. It's one that doesn't have to worry about any of its assorted provinces. It is driven from the centre, by the centre, for the centre, and it intends to expand. It is not for Russia to dictate to NATO what, as a free and democratic structure, NATO chooses to do. We are not aiming to invade Russia. We are inviting any peace-loving group that wishes to join an alliance, to join a peace-loving group that is there on a defensive basis, not an aggressive basis. Well, hang on, hang on. You've got to be careful saying NATO is a peace-loving group. The purpose of NATO, its core purpose, when it was founded and for the decades that followed its foundation, was uh, as, a, as an alliance against the Soviet threat. That was its purpose. Now, there have been various political commentators, not, not, just, not just in Britain, but around the world, who have said that NATO served its purpose. NATO's purpose in the post-Cold War era could not necessarily be described as peaceful or peace-loving if you look at the way it has already intervened in Eastern Europe, in various parts of Eastern Europe in the mid to late 1990s. We look at um, the action that has been taken in terms of Afghanistan and Iraq, okay, that wasn't a full NATO alliance, not by a long way, but we are seeing not NATO behaving as a defense force, but we are seeing it as a proactive force. And we've seen that numerous times in the years since the collapse of the Soviet Union. Name me one country we've invaded as NATO. 
we know we haven't invaded any country as NATO, but our, look at our look point at, is made. We have been there as a defensive organisation. Yes, in defence against our primary enemy that we have seen, which is the North Atlantic Treaty Organisation. The primary opponent to that was Russia. It was, that but what, what about what about what's defense. gone on in Serbia and Kosovo, where we were told that NATO forces were going in to end the horrors of the ethnic cleansing that was going on in there, and also in Bosnia, Sarajevo, a few years before that. But NATO, Kosovo, you look at what was going on a year earlier, it was the other way around. It, it was Kosovans uh, ethnically cleansing Serbs from their areas. It is a very complex history, and NATO took a side in that. What was going on was horrible, it was poisonous, it was evil, but it was on both sides. No, it was poisonous and evil within Serbia, Serbia and Kosovo. Mm -hmm. It was not evil from the point of view of the, the United Nations, sorry, the NATO alliance. So why was it there then? Why was it there? Mm. To maintain what it was stated to be a peacemaking organisation. It did not go in there aggressively to conquer one group or the other. Now, from a Russian perspective... Russia had the... no, ex no perspective. The second, that it was no longer Yugoslavia. No, but I, I'm looking now. I, I, I could discuss that in much more depth, but I'm aware of we got 20 minutes to do this. I'm going to look at where we are in terms of Russia now. And Russia, you could argue, and many senior British politicians of the era have said that not enough was done to bring Russia in from the cold in the years immediately following the collapse of the Soviet Union. But we are where we are with this now. And Russia, economically, it's not in particularly good shape. In terms of its navy, it's not in very good shape at all. In terms of its army, it has modernized hugely in recent years. And it's the, the vodka drinking culture there has been curtailed quite considerably. In terms of military power, Russia is back. And from a Russian perspective, if you can see hostile troops immediately beyond your border, they will see that as a threat and they don't do humiliation. If you poke the bear, you're going to get a response. I don't disagree with you. And if the bear is threatening to pour over the border and rip to pieces a part of what is ostensibly a free and potentially democratic country without any realistic opposition being permitted when Russia poisons its opposition leaders and just takes them out of the picture so that it can say it's got a democracy. Look who won, Putin. Oh, by the way, you're, you get poisoned if you, die, if you dare to stand against him. That's not democracy. That is not what we should be going, going forward towards tell, having the position to tell us what to do in democracy. We well, are completely different. Well, in terms of democracy, as I've already touched on in this podcast, there was nothing very democratic at all about the events of 2014 when President Yanukovych was overthrown, in effect, because he wasn't willing to sign a political association or a trade agreement with the European Union. And as I've already alluded to, there were some very nasty elements in that overthrow, and the EU backed it all the way, as did the United States. There's nothing democratic about that. Uh, there was nothing NATO to do with it either, was there? No, but it was a lot to do with it. Germany America. cannot be relied on as a NATO ally. France can't be relied on as a NATO ally. No, but we saw how the United States, Britain and many European countries and the European Union as a body in its own right did back that overthrow of a democratically elected president of Ukraine by a gang of thugs and the installation of a pro-EU president in the immediate aftermath. I think you're missing one of the major points about the Ukraine. Russia cannot permit the Ukraine to influence the politics of Russia. It's as simple as that. And the simple reason is for exactly the same reason as you will never have democracy in a Muslim country. For the simple reason that your parliament, democratically elected parliament may decide whatever it likes. If the mullahs don't like it, they change it on a Friday night. 
And Russia is in exactly the same position where there has been a re-emergence in Russia of Christianity. Christianity, which is dominated by the Russian, uh, ref um, the Russian Orthodox Church, I think is what you want to say. Orthodox Church, yeah, I lost yeah. that one for a moment. Yeah. Um, and it's dominated by the Russian Orthodox Church, which is centered and commanded from Kiev. I look, I'm in no doubt that Putin is his power is quite considerable after more than two decades. I mean, what was it now? Uh, Boris Yeltsin resigned on the, the very eve of the millennium, just as we were going into the year 2000. Yeah. And well, here we are now, and it's been more than two decades has passed. He's consolidated his power. And the, the, the brief period Russia had in the 1990s of comparative uh, journalistic freedom and opposition freedom, that has been curtailed. We've seen how he's behaved towards such figures. But now, where we are now is his power in Russia is very much so. He's many things. He's a bully. He's controlling. He's a tyrant. He can be cruel. He can be sinister. I cannot see any evidence, though. The one thing he's not is mad. And the one thing that would threaten his power would be to invade Ukraine. That really would threaten his power. And I don't see much evidence that he's going to do that myself. And that the, actually the President uh, Zelensky of Ukraine also believes the same thing as me on that. In the short time we've got left, and we really haven't got much time, so I ask you to be brief on this, please, Greg. One thing we haven't talked about in much depth is, we, we touched on it at the start, but we haven't actually discussed it as such, is the extent to which Ukraine is a divided nation. And this significant Russian-speaking, Russian-identifying minority, um, particularly around the Donetsk area, have been far from impressed with the governments of recent years. And what was seen to remedy that was the Minsk II agreement. And what that did is, look, Ukraine could in theory become a very, very wealthy country because it's got, well, Sebastopol and, and the significance of the port of Sebastopol. We haven't even touched on the situation in Crimea and we're not gonna have time to now. But Minsk II was about essentially creating a federal Ukraine where the individual identities of the various sects of Ukrainian societies were respected whilst maintaining Ukrainian nationhood. Because in terms of Russian language rights and in terms of civil rights, the significant Russian speaking minority doesn't feel as though it plays a full enough part in society and doesn't have the rights that the more European sect identifies with. But Minsk too seems to have gone well and truly on the back burner since about January 2015. And that, I think, is what is at the heart of it in why Ukraine is such an unhappy and such a divided society. Now then, Greg, touch on that if you will, but in your final thoughts in the time we got left, and I ask you to be brief, please. We both agree that war should be the last option. What can be done at this stage to remedy the situation? Make it absolutely clear to Russia we will not be dictated to by one little tin pot, mighty power, who is nothing more than an unreconstituted KGB colonel, who is a bully, as you said, who is willing to use military might as a threat to get his own way. We will stand there, and if he intends to use his military might, I regret to say, if we are going to have peace in the world, we are going to have to be prepared to stop him. And when it comes to Minx too, that was an agreement that was dictated outside of the Ukraine. It was not a Ukrainian treaty. It was one yet again demanded by Russia and agreed to by elements of the European Union. It was a three it was a three-way treaty, but if you just discard that completely, then you're going to end up with civil unrest in Ukraine, which we've seen plenty of in the last 30 years. We have also seen that the Ukraine are the ones who are dis are ignoring Minsk too. They haven't been clamoring for it to be enforced any more than they clamored to have 30,000 people killed in the Crimea. Final point from you then. I don't believe Putin is mad or stupid enough to invade Ukraine. Do you agree with me on that? No. You think he could do it, do you? Uh, I think he could. I think he is mad enough and stupid enough 
and so self-important that he could do it easily in the realization that it can probably be controlled on the basis he can bully his way into it and have minimum numbers killed but he would have that no those numbers killed quite happily he was mad enough and brutal enough to do it in the Crimea what makes you think he's any damn different well look the, the Crimea was a different situation that was overwhelmingly Russian and we've got to take into account the Sevastopol situation there but Greg I'm afraid we are out of time this has been a fascinating discussion there's a lot of overlap between your view and mine some areas of disagreement listeners will make up their own mind but it is good to be back even under such serious circumstances my thanks to Greg as always my thanks to you for listening join us again next time <laughs>